Awesome. There is Michael Butney, just saw him. <laughs> yeah. All right. All righty. It is 10.05. We are one minute late. Look at that. Michael, are you okay? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm good. Um, I think we, most of the people are already on. We're missing about 15, 20, but they'll come on in a couple minutes. Um, okay. Before I hand it over to the powers to be, uh, welcome everybody. Um, if you have a question, I ask you please to put it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, with so many people here, I'm gonna mute everybody in a second except for the candidates. If you can unmute yourself when it's time to talk. Uh, we're, unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna have a chance to do verbal questions because we have a lot of content to cover. And there's gonna be a lot of questions that we have for the candidates, so we'll try to get to all of them. Uh, Michael Putney, of course, will be handling those. And our Mayor Weissman will be handling the chat room. So um, I guess let's get started. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Gary Pye for some introductions. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. We've got a big group today, as Michael said, almost 80, 80 some people. And it's, uh, it's a very important topic that we're talking about. So the first thing I want to do, I know we're on a tight schedule, is thank our partners for today, the City of Aventura and the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. Let's it now. You we okay, Michael? Yeah. Okay. So again, our partners we thank for today are the City of Aventura and the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have Edith, Edith Weissman here, our mayor for the City of Aventura, and we have Jerry Libin here for the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. So I will turn it over to Enid first to do a little welcome, and then I will turn it over to Jerry. Enid? Enid? I'm muted. All right, I was muted. I'm sorry, but I really want to thank all of you for attending this morning. It speaks volumes when a community gets involved. It does take a whole community. Um, Jerry, I don't see you, but I want to thank the Beach Chamber for co-sponsoring it. You know, we all have always felt that Northeast Dade from Aventura and to South Beach gets neglected. Um, people just forget we're here other than our own school board member. So let me, Martin, on behalf of everyone, thank you for your incredible 12 years of service, of always answering a phone, of always being there for us, of often you're making the call, what do you need? We appreciate everything you've done, and I'm speaking on behalf of our community. Great. Thank you, Enid. Jerry, I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, we certainly don't forget about you. Elaine Adler is a dear friend of ours and uh, Gary Pyatt and our chamber is proud to be uh, working jointly with you as a sponsor on this program. It's so important. We really appreciate the opportunity and anything we can do to partner with the Amateur Marketing Council, we're always happy to do that. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jerry. We appreciate both the City of Aventura and the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce for being our partners this morning. And we also have Dr. Martin Karp, our dedicated here in the North section, our dedicated school board member representing our district for the past 16 years. Dr. Martin Karp, I'll turn it over to you for a second. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess, Elaine, this is my time, right? Okay, <laughs> All right, I'll go quickly. Yes. Um, I want to thank you, Elaine, and the Aventura Marketing Council. I want to acknowledge Ron Wasson, Eric Soroka, Enid Wiseman, for sure, and past elected mayors and commissioners. It's an honor and privilege. This is District 3, downtown all the way to the county line. Recent initiatives as a policymaker for me, academic safety net for students during this time of COVID. Recently, I did an item on scapegoating, stereotyping, and anti-Semitism. I've identified anti-Israel biases in our education system. I bring that up because I want to thank the Aventura Mayor and Commission on their recent resolution regarding Florida State. Thank you. I also have a resolution, or not a resolution, but an item coming to the board regarding internet safety. We're asking our students as young as kindergarten to be on per virtual platforms. They're going to be exposed to websites, Zoom bombs, <laughs> other things. We need to help prepare them and their parents. We are an A-rated district with zero F schools. High school graduation rates are close to 90%. Locally, crops is up nearly 15% during the past eight years. 
I've had an increased emphasis on science research, and we've now had the science fair at a place, not a shopping mall, but at a community college to elevate it. As a board, we approve the expansion of youth mental health first aid training. Average teacher salaries are up more than 10,000 annually. Health insurance per employee up 50%. Central office positions cut in half. The school district's millage was at its lowest since 1979. Facilities. Every District 3 school has had significant facility upgrades. Two of our candidates who teach at Miami Beach High know that this school, which happens to be my alma mater, was in disrepair when I began my service. We replaced that school, and the story is a very different one today. I wish I could itemize facility and academic upgrades in every District 3 school, but that's not possible. So I will focus on the traditional public schools that serve this area, specifically Aventura Waterways K-8. That was a new school, and I was told, we can't do technology upgrades because it's a newer school. Well, you know what? A 10-year-old school is not new, and if you use the same smartphone you had 10 years ago today, you wouldn't get anything done. So we were able to push and make it happen. Um, in the fall, I prep North will open right on the crop campus. It's the only Miami-Dade County Public School collaborating with LEGO, where we start this year with students in grades six to nine, and that's for this area. I know there's people in Bal Harbor, I've seen the mayor from Bal Harbor, Miami Beach, so on, but um, two charter schools here. I visit them, my philosophy is, has been, I want our children to have great schools. I offer them information on professional development and have relationships with their administrators who are excellent, by the way. I wanna also, as I get close to wrapping up, survey results in District 3. 53% of the parents indicated that they would prefer to have their students at a brick and mortar site, with 47% saying they'd rather have their kids in a virtual platform. I have to acknowledge the district staff. They are working very hard to address this. We will work through this, but when we talk about reopening using virtual platforms, we need to understand there's the health and well-being of our teachers and our students, but also, and there'll be the challenges of wearing masks, but the fact is some teachers will be teaching from home where they'll have children too. So they have to supervise and guide their own children. There's gonna be cooking, household chores, and they have to run classrooms. And this is something we have to keep in mind as we push <laughs> through this. Finally, I am committed to ensuring a smooth transition in November. I live here and I will continue to serve just in a different capacity. Thanks again, Elaine, and thank you for your friendship and partnership with Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Programs such as Anchors Away will always be near and dear to my heart, and thanks to all of you who are watching today. Your input has helped me better represent you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karp, and again, thank you for your dedicated 16 years of service to us and always being a partner of the uh, Aventura Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much. Thank and you. now, without these programs, we all know we have sponsors for these programs to help us with these. Our two sponsors today are Lynette Sabugo of Atlantic Broadband and James Blaisdale of Code Ninjas. Uh, Lynette, I will turn it over to you for a minute. Thank you, and good morning. I'm actually going to have my counterpart, Angel, speak in regards to our company. He is the um, Director of Sales, Commercial Sales in Florida. So, Angel, please go ahead and take it. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, technology. Thank you. It is very nice to meet all of you, uh, even though it's uh, virtually, but I'm sure at some point we will meet in person. Uh, Atlantic Broadband is very uh, excited to be part of this organization and a very uh, proud of our sponsor of, of this meeting. Uh, Atlantic Broadband is the eight largest uh, cable operating uh, company in the United States. We provide TV, internet, phone, and enterprise business services to more than 450 bus 450,000 businesses and residential customers across 11 states. Here in South Florida, Atlantic Broadband provides an extensive and redundant fiber network and a portfolio of business grade products that are scalable and adjusting to the times that we live in today. Atlantic broadband in internet speeds are ranging from 10 megs to all the way up to 10 gigs, a point to point connectivity between multiple locations and, and phone service. As we're all transforming into a new normal, <coughs> we'll be con continuing to work from home. Uh, so bringing uh, the office into home is more and more important. One of those products in particular that we're selling uh, is our hosted voice solution, which enables businesses 
to stay in touch with customers, even though they're working remotely from home or somewhere else. That, that reduces office time and maximizes customer engagement. To that end, ABB or Atlanta Broadband is also moving into that digital direction. Our staff is working from home, troubleshooting uh, with online web sessions uh, with our customers and increasing the, the use of self installation kits when available. Um, I hope uh, you enjoy our program today and we learn valuable information about the District 3 uh, school board uh, candidates. I thank you very much for your time. Stay healthy and be safe. Thank and you. thank you to Atlantic Broadband. Thank you very thank much. You. I'll turn it over now to really quickly to Code Ninjas and James Blaisdell. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm James Blaisdell with Code Ninjas. Uh, we're a coding learning center for kids uh, ages uh, 5 to 14. Uh, we teach uh, computer programming by building their own video games. So uh, we we have a proprietary blended four-year curriculum where our ninjas advance from white belt to black, uh, from zero experience to designing, building, uploading, and monetizing their own video games uh, on their favorite app store. Uh, right now, we are running summer camps, uh, both at the center and virtual. Um, this camp is uh, Roblox Studios, where students are learning to code their own games in Roblox. They're using a language called uh, Lua for code functions. Uh, we have a lead sensei teaching the class, a second sensei helping with questions around the dojo, and we also have two more senseis focused on the virtual campers. Uh, due to the new online school plans, we are launching an in-dojo online school program from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. for parents to drop off their kiddos uh, online on online school days. Uh, we will leverage our equipment and tutors to keep kids um, uh, to ensure that they have an outstanding academic year. Uh, we will limit class sizes to 10 students, each uh, with their own workstation and equipment. When they're not on a virtual class, our tutors and teachers will focus on uh, ensuring they stay on top of their homework and assignments. For those that complete their schoolwork early, we have plenty of fun coding and STEM activities to keep them engaged in learning. We have strict procedures to ensure everyone's safety. We do temperature checks uh, for anyone entering the center. Parents are not allowed inside the dojo. Children must wash their hands prior to entering the classroom and are encouraged to use hand sanitizers throughout the day. All students and staff must wear a face mask and we provide anyone with, uh, everyone with face shields for added protection. Prior to entering the dojo, students will wipe their feet on our disinfectant mat. In addition to disinfecting all equipment after each use, we also use UV light sticks throughout the day on high traffic areas such as uh, door knobs and countertops. <coughs> We also have uh, acquired smog sanitizing equipment, which we use to sanitize the entire center every night. And we also have invested in hospital grade air purifiers, which are scattered throughout the center. <coughs> we are located. <coughs> James? Did we lose James? Uh, Aventures at uh, 305-395-7080. 305-395-7080. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, James, and thank you, Atlantic Broadband. Now, let's get on with the program that we're all here today about. I'm going to turn it over to our Mayor, Enid Weissman. Okay. Um, uh, our formats have changed all the way up until almost the opening of this session. So I think at this point, it is beyond a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and a friend of our entire community, um, Elaine, I'm doing the right thing? Uh, um, yes, your special okay. remarks, Michael, and then our two sponsors each have their special okay. remarks. Um, Michael Putney is a legend. He doesn't want me to say this. Believe me, he doesn't. But he is a legend in honest, ethical, real journalism in South Florida. He's a senior political reporter. He's won two Emmys. He's my friend. He's a resident and a constituent, and we couldn't have gotten a better person. And he never says no to us. So, Michael, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I think the, there are two other people that have something to say. James, you're up. I have the pleasure of uh, helping to introduce Michael Putney, our own Emmy Award winning reporter and television host. Uh, Michael began his career in broadcast journalism in 1966 while a graduate student, uh, first as a radio reporter and then as a news director in Missouri. After working in Washington, D.C. in Missouri, the Miami Herald lured him to Florida where uh, to write his uh, for its uh, Saturday magazine topic. 
uh, Michael came to Local 10 in 1989 to become senior political reporter and host of This Week in South Florida with Michael Putney, earning him two Emmys. He is Local 10's uh, senior reporter on politics and government and writes a uh, semi-monthly column of, on politics for the Miami Herald and has earned many awards for his astute political reporting. Michael's knowledge and experience with political issues is virtually unmatched among South Florida news professionals. He's been to Cuba a dozen of times, has covered the Marielle boat lifts, immigration accords, talks in Havana, Washington, D.C., and New York, and an in-depth interview with Cuban National Assembly President Ricardo Alarcón. He said his favorite part of being a reporter is talking to newsmakers and trying to pull out facts, some of which he said is occasionally the truth. He has entered, he has earned the respect of people from all walks of life, from senior state senators to senior grandmother and all in between. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Michael Putney. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> if you hear me, have you, have you got me there, Michael Stern? Yes. You're good. Oh, good? Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much. What a privilege and honor to be part of this because I love living in Aventura. It is the city of excellence. So many friends of mine uh, are on this call. And uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Dr. Martin Karp for 12 outstanding years of service. We could not have been better represented uh, on the Miami-Dade County School Board than we have been by Martin Karp. So Marty, thank you so much. Uh, there are five outstanding candidates for the seat in District 3, and in just a minute, we are going to hear from them sequentially, and uh, my great friend, Enid Wiseman. By the way, I don't believe in term limits. I would make an exception for Enid. <laughs> She's just such a great, such a great mayor and a good friend. So um, I'm going to ask a couple of kind of basic questions. Uh, then Enid has questions uh, of her own. You know, she is an educator. Uh, and also from the chat room, many questions have been submitted. So let's begin. We're going to introduce the candidates alphabetically. And the first is Lucia Baez-Geller. Uh, Lucia, 15 years teaching Miami Beach Senior High, been a part of this community for over 30 years. She is a first generation Colombian, Cuban American, her parents instilled in her the importance of education. She has been a steward in the teachers union, very active. She has gone to Tallahassee and Washington on behalf of her students. Uh, it is a pleasure. Lucia, are you with us? Absolutely. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Mr. Putney. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, if I can, Lucia, I think that the question of the day uh, is a pretty obvious one. Here we are in the midst of pandemic, school has been ordered to begin classes in, in, the, in the schoolhouse uh, next month by the state education commissioner. And yet there is you know, discretion on the part of individual school boards. If you were a member, if you are a member of the school board, uh, what would you be in favor of doing? A, either in school five days a week or a combination of uh, distance learning and in school or a hybrid system? Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's here. I'd like to uh, recognize all of you, but I'll go ahead and, and honor your question, Mr. Putney. So my beliefs are that until we can ensure that all in our community are going to be safe, then no one is safe. Um, so school reopening in the fall, it would be right now a great danger to all of us. And I know that um, Dr. Karp mentioned the statistics of who wants distance learning and who wants hybrid. And those are great statistics to have for when our county is in a phase two per se, when we've met all of the eight standards that our superintendent and our county mayor are putting out for safety in terms of positivity rates. Um, so for me in transition, it's not too early, even though it looks like we're gonna open to distance learning in the fall, 
um, it's not too early to talk about our transition into phase two, where we will be faced with those decisions about hybrid, schoolhouse, or fully distance learning. And so what I would say is it's the time is now to start talking about this phase two transition, to establish protocols for safety that are guided by science and by best practices, that we are ensuring that we can have safety for all across the board, that we're talking to communities to see what are some of the things we learned from our transition in March uh, to distance learning so that we can improve. We also need to make sure that we are protecting our most vulnerable students and communities, especially our special needs uh, students and ensuring that everybody has the basic tools. And again, we want to, whether it's hybrid schoolhouse or distance learning, we wanna ensure that we're still keeping that personal touch with our families, students, um, and that we're building and reinforcing the relationships that we know are important for our families. Okay, good. Well, good timing. The bell just went off. Uh, Lucia, one more question before I uh, turn it over to Enid for a question or two, uh, and that is about charter schools. Um, thankfully, we have in Aventura two outstanding charter schools, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the waterways K through eight and the Don Sofer Aventura High School. Uh, very proud of those schools. But, you know, frankly, uh, the state legislature over the last couple of years has shown, in my view, kind of a disproportionate favoritism in funding charter schools, not as much capital going into conventional, uh, traditional public schools, uh, where do you stand on support for uh, public uh, charter schools and public schools? Absolutely. So for me, charter schools, they arose out of a need that was demonstrated <clears throat> by parents in our community, and they felt that their needs weren't being met. So as a school board member, I have to be aware that there are places that we need to be fixing traditional gaps in our traditional schools um, so that we could do better in, in providing for our communities. Um, I've dedicated my life to traditional public schools. I'm a traditional public school teacher at Miami Beach Senior High for 15 years. Uh, but as a school board member, my job is to ensure that everybody on the community has access to a world-class education. And we need to hold both private schools or charter schools and uh, traditional public schools accountable. Um, and we also need to ensure that our state legislature is not really pitting public schools against charter schools when it comes to funding. Um, and charter schools are here. We wanna make sure that we hold them all accountable. Uh, we, we also though wanna make sure that we're reviewing the practices in all of our schools, traditional or charter, to ensure that they are benefiting our community. Okay, thank you. And um, Mayor Wiseman, Enid, um, if you've got a question of your own or from the chat room, why don't you jump in here and ask it? Enid Wiseman, are you there? Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we do. Okay, so my, my organization, Michael was a little different. Um, what I have on my agenda is you were going to read everybody's bio because I would like to pose that same question to the rest of our candidates so we can all see how they stand on it. Okay, but that sounds good. So is shall okay? I go down? Shall yes, I go please. down the rest of the bios? Please. Okay. All right. Well, th th let me begin or go on then with Dr. Raquel Bill Glibben, uh, a very well-known name. She's been on. Channel 10, I know. Uh, she is a, a psychologist. She has been a, a leader in the Psychological Association, the uh, president, Bay County Psychological Association. She's received many awards for her work, an invited guest on CBS 4 News, Local 10, Telemundo, Fox 5 in New York. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Raquel Bild Liven, please join us and introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, you've done a very good introduction. I appreciate it. And I really thank everybody for this forum. 
um, having earned a master's in education and a PhD in counseling psychology. Obviously, I'm trying to merge my experience in education and psychology on behalf of what I perceive to be the, the missing voice in our school board, which is the mental health policies in our school system. I have many, many examples that I would like to give of how policy gets to be implemented for the children, particularly now that we have COVID and that all of the children when they return to school are going to be coming with what we almost call <coughs> collective trauma. Everybody's coming from a different place with a lot of the pediatrics and the psychological literature saying we are going to be seeing a lot of new things that need to be addressed in order to achieve the academic progress that we want to have. So for me, the missing voice in the school board is one of guiding mental health, which has become finally a priority, not only in the federal government, <coughs> but in the state as well as locally. I am a firm believer that you need somebody with research experience that can bring the up-to-date of what's happening to our schools. For example, Dr. Karp just today is putting in an initiative that he just sent on the predators on the internet. And we never saw that before, but children are beginning from very elementary school to get predators on the internet that they have more access to now. And this is something that is new that we wouldn't have known unless you're reading the research on this. Examples are the legislature wants us to start all of the mental health um, you know, training in sixth grade. It's too late. We need to do that in kindergarten. If you don't begin in kindergarten, you cannot get to the biases. You cannot get to children learning interpersonal skills. So we need to go earlier. A lot of the policies that are being given to us are being given without a research scientific base. And I want to bring that scientific base to the policies in the school system. Thank you. Dr. Bill Levin, thank you. I just want to say, I remember attending a school board meeting, meeting uh, in, I think, about 2008, when the economy was in a free fall, and they were discussing the school board, I'm sure Dr. Karp remembers, they were discussing where they could make cuts, and most of the cuts were with school counselors. And it, it, it was, you know, to the, to the credit of Dr. Karp and others, they did not cut them as deeply as they had planned to, but that was, they thought then, an area that was expendable. It certainly, as you say, uh, is not expendable. All right, let's move on to our next candidate, who is Marcella Gomez Bogomolny. And Marcella, uh, I'm glad I do not know her, glad to meet her this morning. She is a public servant, a social worker for the past 25 years, a therapist, self-help coach, advocate for minorities, a successful business owner who has used education to boost people's morale, self-image, and success. She has um, a couple of advanced degrees, a bachelor's degree, uh, in social work and mass communications, also master's degree in clinical social work, and she has been accepted into a PhD program. So, uh, and her husband, I would like to say, is a clergy member of the clergy at Temple Beth Torah, the Benny Rock campus. So, uh, if we can, let's welcome Marcella Gomez Bogomolny. Marcella, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. And this is a, an honor for me to be with you all. Um, I'm going to um, be more than honored to tell you the reasons why I am running for this position. I'm running for the Miami-Dade Public Schools District 3. In any means to replace such an important person like Dr. Martin, Martin Carpet to bring to the table something that we have ignored for the past 20 years per se which is the mental health and the emotional stability of our kids. 
for years we have had the academics in the school board, but now the mental health and the social issues were ignored for all these years. According to the Florida Youth Risk Behavior Survey, in a universe of 3,556 people, our kids in, since 10 to 14, they have tripled the issues of uh, mental health pathologies in our schools. We've been um, ambitioning for them to be better. So my platform brings to them uh, and to the teachers bring more counselors and work specifically in mental health, bringing art and sports as a tool of intervention. That's basically uh, my platform that will bring a well-rounded education and a stability for our well-being. Our kids required for our schools to do not ignore anymore the social reality they are in, the use of drugs, the anxiety, and also the depression and suicidal ideation that in some of the schools have been going on. We are happy with the academics and all the efforts that the school board has been doing, but also some of the parents are afraid of, of the school system for the simple fact that they not only want ACE, they also want safety. Thank you very much. Marcella, thank you very much. And I know Enid will have a question for you on other things like you know, what do we do with uh, the pandemic and taking, bringing kids back to school? Let's move on to our next candidate, who is Josh Levy. Mr. Levy is the only candidate who has children right now in our schools. Michael Stern, if you want to pop Mr. Levy up, that would be good. Uh, Jonathan Joshua Levy uh, owns his own business. He's an advocate for public education long before he became a candidate for the Miami-Dade County School Board. He's the president of the Miami Beach Bar Association. Uh, he started an after-school law club, which provides mentorships and internships. Uh, he has really been involved in education for a long time. So it is a pleasure to uh, introduce Joshua Levy. Mr. Levy, join us. Tell us why you're running. Well, I could tell you the litany of experience I've had over the years. But the bottom line is I'm the only candidate with children currently in our schools. I'm the only candidate with skin in the game with my children going to public education. Uh, so I want to talk about the biggest issue as a parent, and that's how we're going to open up schools in the fall. If we are going to open up schools, I know firsthand what happened in the spring with my children's learning. I know one child had a great education and the other one barely had an education. She was on ingenuity all day and talking to her friends on Facebook and that not, will not happen again. I want to talk about how six in 10 parents are likely to continue home learning, according to the stats. That 18% of teachers and 27% of principals fall into the high risk category. I want to talk about how the term safely reopen our schools is misleading because we don't have a vaccine yet. So we can't really say we're going to safely open up our schools. If we do get to a point where we can open up our schools and listen, and I will listen to the science on this, we'll make a determination of how we're going to do it. And it has to start from the very first moment the child wakes up and the parent takes the temperature to getting on the bus, to getting into the classroom, to moving classrooms, to going to the bathrooms, to eating lunch. All of this has to work out. If we're online, we need to start talking about what are we going to do with the parents who have to work who can't take care of their children at home. I bring the parents' perspective to this. And I can't wait to continue my advocacy for the parents, the teachers, and the students. Because as a lawyer with 25 years experience, I know how to get things done, whether or not it's at the Quality of Education Committee or the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, Josh Levy, let me ask you um, to explain briefly, how is it that one of your children had a very good productive experience with distance learning? Was it the teacher? Was it the child? And why did one have such a, a bad experience? A great question. Um, so I have two children. One's at uh, New World School of the Arts for theater, and the other one's at Nautilus. Uh, the one at New World School of the Arts, the teachers were engaged, were passionate. They, they made sure the kids had Zoom. Uh, at Nautilus, they switched to more of an ingenuity, which is just an online learning, and it wasn't an effective tool. So we need to change that. We need to get more innovative with the online learning. All right, well, it's an interesting story and maybe illustrative of the challenges of distance learning. Uh, I'd like to hear more about it. All right, let's move on uh, to Russ Rywell. Mr. Rywell is our fifth candidate today, not the last, however, uh, in order of importance. He is a teacher at Miami-Dade County, uh, Miami Beach High School, I believe. He was born in Miami Beach, attended county public schools, 
graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Rensselaer. Uh, he has a master of science degree from MIT. He worked in finance in New York for Citigroup. Then he went to uh, Singapore, was successful there with currency options, a fairly uh, uh, sophisticated part of the finance world. Uh, in 2001, he left his successful career in finance to come home, become a high school teacher uh, during two decades of teaching. He has built two speech and debate programs, coached national champions, helped raise and award almost $150,000 in scholarships. So please welcome Russ Rywell. Mr. Rywell, why are you running? Why are you the best candidate here? Thank you, Michael, and welcome to all my friends at the Aventura Marketing Council. I really enjoyed the Speed Biz event that I did before. And uh, I think Michael's gone over my qualifications. So let's talk about what's going on right now. We are in the middle of a public health and in another year financial crisis. And we're going to need somebody on the board that combines both educational and business experience. And I think I'm that person. Let's talk a little bit about the situation we're in. Right now, we are not meeting any of the eight metrics. In June 23rd, I said, we're not gonna be able to open the school system safely. You can look at the Temple Beth Shalom uh, Forum. We are at 130% of our ICU bed capacity. We have 40 pediatric ICU beds left. We are testing positive over 25%. We need to get under 10%. We are not gonna open these schools. I will fight tooth and nail to stop opening the schools if it's not safe. When we do open, First, we're going to be in an online system, and I've taught already. I've had my classes in Zoom. I realize that's not the norm across the board, and we need to standardize it. That's why we'll have a more in-depth on school online, my school online program, where the students follow EEE, -E -E, every teacher, every day, every class. We need to get to that. We need to start training the teachers now to make sure that they're comfortable with it and the system works. When we get the metrics under control and we can go to some form of physical learning, then we need to follow the C principles, S-E-E, -E, safety, education, and equity. I will work hard to make that happen with all the skills in my toolkit. And that's why the people that went through a long vetting process and deal with the school board, like the United Teachers of Dade and the Miami Herald, think that I am the best person for the job, and I hope you will agree. Uh, Russ, if I may, let me ask you to further explicate this financial crisis. Um, obviously, the school system funded by property taxes and then receives other revenues as well. Uh, how serious do you expect the financial crisis for the school system to become, and what? how would you contribute to better managing its, uh, its money? Thank you, Michael. That's an excellent question. <coughs> I've listened to uh, the budget meetings and workshops. I've listened to the chief financial officer of the district, uh, Ron Steiger, speak. This year, with even though the sales tax are down 30%, 20 to 30%, um, with the rainy day funds of Florida, with the CARES Act, um, and it's an election year, we will squeak by um, with some freezes in place. Steiger thinks that we'll have about $18 million to spend on PPE. I don't necessarily think that'll be enough, so we're going to need public and private partnerships to supplement that, and I've certainly worked with people in the community as uh, alumni chairman of Miami Beach Senior High raising that scholarship money that you mentioned. The real question that I think you're getting at is what happens in the next school year. Um, right. There's going to be no election. Um, sales tax revenues are going to be down. Property tax revenues are probably going to be down. I saw that uh, Commissioner Goldman asked about the Florida lottery. I think right now about 20% of the funds come from there. 25% of their funds come to the system. But we are talking about a 10 to 20% budget cut. The number that the superintendent uh, mentioned was $240 million. That is a huge hole. That is not something that's just going to go away. 
I will probably be an unpopular board member. I think the entire board will be unpopular. But this is how you have to address a budget. You have to have principles at the top, and then you have to look at the details on the bottom of the 300 page budget. My guiding principles, as I said, are safety, education, and equity. We have to ensure safety for our students, teachers, and the parents they go home to. We need to make sure we have good educational outcomes and we need to provide equity. If we don't get some shiny new tech that we don't need, that's great. But those are the guiding principles that I will use to get us through this difficult period. Thank you. All right, great answer. Safety, education, and equity. All right, let's go back now to Mayor Wiseman. Enid, uh, take it away. I know you have questions that we have received online have been submitted and you have some of your own. Take it away, Enid Wiseman. Thank you, my, thank you, Michael. Um, just so we're all on the same agenda, this is sort of going to be like a rapid fire round. Um, I'm going to start with Raquel. <laughs> One minute answers and please Brianne time because we, you know, we want to make sure we use the time wisely. Could you please explain the state accountability system? And is there part of it that you think should change? We'll start with Raquel. Is there accountability for the schools? Is that yeah. the question? Okay, both private and public schools? No, the state accountability system does not apply to private. Okay, so I believe that there has to be some kind of transparency and accountability only because so many of the schools, like in Aventura, are great. On the other hand, so many other schools have gone under and the financial administration has not been there with public dollars. So there has to be some accountability in terms of transparency to the public and in terms of across the board teacher certification. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Same question. Uh, please explain the state accountability system and is there a part of it that you think should change? Yes. The state accountability system at this point always bring the teachers to have to teach to the test. Basically, our teachers in our community of schools have to be teaching the kids to the test so they can have enough funds once they have the numbers they require the, the grades. For me, that's unfair, not only for the teachers, but also for the students. On the other hand, I also would like to change, yes, the accountability and, and change it to other areas like financial, but also how the schools are responding to the issues happening within the schools on safety and, uh, and mental health issues. So there is accountability towards the state on, on terms of how the teachers are have to have to show that they are good teachers by teaching only to the test so the, so the, the okay, students the minute, pass. The minute is up. The minute's up. I've got to ask my timer to I'm please. I'm sorry. Forget about the minute. I, that's what I <laughs> Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, yes, no you, right. get, you get involved. Okay, next, same question. If you need me to repeat it, ask Lucia. Thank you, Mayor. So our state uh, accountability system, I would be in favor of reviewing how we're holding our, our schools and our teachers accountable. We should not just be grading our schools and our teachers based on their performance on an exam. I think it leads to a hostile environment in our schools and stifles learning and it stifles teachers from doing what they really want to do. Uh, so we need to continue to uh, include rigor into our classes. And we of course want assessments, but we don't want to trap our students in our schools in an evaluation system that tracks them and limits them. Thank you. Same question, Josh Levy. It's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, let's start with charter schools and voucher systems. If the state accountability does not apply to them, and they should, simply because they're using taxpayer money. Um, in 2015, 30 different charter school, in 30 different districts, a charter school closed after they received about 70 million in funding. Here in Miami-Dade County, charter schools closed after receiving 7.5 million in funding. So there needs to be some accountability in that respect. There also needs to be accountability in terms of teacher certification. There was an article in, in the Broward Charter System that one in five parents weren't, one in five teachers weren't certified. So I'm concerned with um, the type of education they're receiving. 
But let's also talk about the, the, the testing that correlates to how, how a teacher is doing. Um, I'm a history major, and I couldn't wait to t talk history with my daughters, the Civil War, uh, whatever in American history. My kids weren't learning American history. They were memorizing for a test. Okay. Um, same question to Russ Rywell. Do you need me to repeat it? That's a great question. And I am in the middle of the state accountability because I teach both a geometry class that has an end of course assessment. And I also see the contrast in my debate class where I have freedom to, treat, to teach critical thinking. We need accountability and we need some system to evaluate our schools and teachers. But the current system we have is flawed. Uh, I started off giving one end of course exam in geometry honors. Now I have to give a midterm, a pretest, and eight unit tests. Okay, each one of those is an hour and a half gone from my teaching day. And that is not serving our children best. And I understand what it is because I've lived it. Now let's look at the other side of the coin, speech and debate. I can explore and have discourse on topics like charter schools, which was actually the national uh, topic that we came in 17th this past year at Beach High. I see that I can teach the students to think, to evaluate and construct an argument. That's what we need to do and that's what I will fight for. Uh, in this uh, Okay, I have another quick, line, uh, very fast question, but I was asked to tell everyone we may go over the hour. We may, because we've got a lot of great questions here. <clears throat> this time I'm going to start with Marcia and we're following the same order. Um, how do you feel about gifted programs? Would you increase funding to these programs? And that is to Marcia. Marcela. Marcella, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. No problem. Give the programs are a gift to, to our community and they need to be supported and also um, empowered. However, we also need to open our doors for those that are less fortunate and open them to, to, for them to be supported and empowered. I'm talking about the African-American community that for years have been in some way neglected to be admitted to these programs. I will, I will not only support these programs, but make them, make them more available for those that are less fortunate. Not because they are not ready to go for those programs, but probably because we need to work a little more to support this part of the community so they can be as successful as the rest of the community, as the rest of our district schools. So yes, I love them. I, I believe that they need to be uh, supported. They need to be funded, but also they need to be open to the other part of our community that is not being uh, benefited from. Thanks. Okay, Lucia. Thank you. Uh, I'm absolutely in favor of supporting our gifted and special education programs. Uh, I think inclusion the definition of inclusion in our public schools uh, needs to be expanded and we can work on um, providing more training to teachers and ensuring that we hold our gifted program accountable. We also wanna ease access to our gifted programs and kind of uh, cut out some of that bureaucracy and red tape that our community members are finding as they go in to get their students tested. We wanna make that easier. And then as always, we wanna have um, outcomes for the gifted program that are based on student success and that we can agree upon is gonna uh, help students move forward and achieve in life. Thank you. Uh, same question to Josh Levy. Another great question. Uh, it is true that there's a disproportionate amount of students of uh, African Americans who are not in gifted programs. And the simple reason is a lot of people are able to take the test outside of our school. And it's a lot, they go up to a, a tester and they check the box and they're in. We need to make sure that all the tests are done in the school so everybody has a fair, same level playing field. Um, it has to be fair, and I do support an increase for the gifted program, but there's other programs as well that we needed to look at. You could be gifted at Nautilus, for example, and not be in the uh, uh, junior scholars program. So we need to look at what's going on in each school in terms of the gifted and the other programs as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rywell, same question. Thank you. I know this is something near and dear to board member Karp's heart. 
and ESE cuts both ways. Again, I'd like to share a little personal experience. In 1972 and 73, when the city you're living in was a swamp, I went to the Highland Oaks Middle School, uh, not middle school, elementary school. Unfortunately, it still looks a bit the same today, um, to a gifted program as a fourth grader. It was the best educational experience I have had in the public school system. We created civilizations, made artifacts, buried them, dug up the other classes' artifacts, created a museum. I went to the air traffic controllers because I won a paper airplane contest. It is what's best about teaching in our system. And it's about giving that opportunity to everybody and setting high expectations. I know Commissioner uh, Marks has a lot of experience with that, setting high expectations, telling our students that they can achieve. And that's what Gifted's about. That's okay, Raquel, same question. Uh, yes, I have spoken to many different parents of gifted children and their teachers. And I think the problem we have with the gifted program today is that all they're doing is giving more work to the kids and not really teaching to what the curriculum is supposed to be. The curriculum is supposed to be very specific, creating creativity, critical thinking. It's a different type of curricula. We need to have special education for the teachers that are going to be teaching gifted in order to do service and justice to the program itself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question. If a school was severely overcrowded and their administration felt that many children were coming from outside of their attendance boundaries, what would be your plan to help that school with its issue? Um, it goes to Lucia. Well, as always, when we are dealing with our issues at schools, we wanna make sure that we involve all of the community stakeholders. So especially in this case, our PTSAs, our HOAs, our cities, uh, we want to make sure everybody's involved in providing the best access to education. Unfortunately, there are gaps in the system where we have not been able to follow up. I think the most important part, though, is that we are having that one-on-one -on -one communication with families across the school district to ensure that we're doing home visits, that we are calling, updating our contact information, I think is huge. Even during distance learning, there's a lot of students I couldn't find because I didn't have a number for them. So we wanna be having authentic forms of communication so that uh, throughout the whole school year, we know where our students are. That's time. Thank you. Josh, same question. Do I need to repeat it? Nope, you do not. Um, as a parent, I know firsthand what it's like when you show up with your daughter and she goes into her math class and there's 56 kids in the math room. I know what the frustration as a parent of what it's like to see overcrowding. So what do we need to do to fix this issue of overcrowding and not having people come to your schools? Fix all the schools. Make it so the local community takes pride in that school, that they want to send their kids to, that the facilities are great, <coughs> that, that you know, the teachers are fantastic, that they don't even want to think about going anywhere but that school. Get, as vice chair of the Chamber of Commerce, I bring the business experience that I can get the business and the community involved with our schools. Uh, Feinberg Fisher on the beach needed um, items for their PTSA. So I walked the hall with, with a, a restaurant owner and he then took it upon himself and now they just call him and he gives them whatever they need. That's how we fix this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Same question, Russ. Could you repeat the question, please? Um, I think I can. <laughs> if a school was severely overcrowded, and their administration felt that many children were coming from outside of their attendance boundary. What would your plan be to help that school? Thank you. This is a critical question for this group. I've spoken to many parents and I've heard you. In a time where we need to practice social distancing, where literally our students, teachers, and parents' lives are at stake, we cannot tolerate overcrowding. We are trying to reduce density. And that's a result of boundary jumping. Sunny Isles Beach, Ruth K. Broad, there are agreements and there are boundaries for a purpose. These boundaries are not being enforced. And I would work 
and use my political capital with the superintendent to enforce those boundaries so that kids can go to their neighborhood schools and we can do it safely. And I agree, we have to make other schools better. We have to invest in the urban core. We have to have a system that benefits all students with great classes or else we don't have a system at all. But it starts with enforcing our rules and protecting the boundaries. Thank you. Raquel, okay. same question. So I think it's a great question because I know that, for example, the Bay Harbor community has had this problem. I know that, for example, Sony Alza has had this problem. I think that one of the most important things the board can do is in trying to look for a way to vet who are the students that go to each of the schools so that we can keep the boundary of the school intact. I think that obviously we're looking for some areas in which the population increase has been higher than the schools that are being planned for that area. And uh, therefore there may be overcrowding that we need to look more long-term in terms of new schools. But at this point, I think it's very important, as many of the others have said, that we need to strengthen the schools in which those students that are coming from other areas go to our areas that do not belong there. And every parent, I don't blame them, wants the best education for their kids. And therefore, they're going to go whatever that is. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Marcella, same question. <laughs> Thank you, Marcella. Overcrowded is part of the, uh, is part of our several schools in our district. Um, and yes, Sony House, even Crop. But one of the things that I believe that will help the school is to address these parents once they are identified what, which kids are there that are not supposed to be there. Straining the rules are important, but the reasons why these parents are looking for better schools than the ones in their neighborhood, it's very important to know. So one, we need to address these parents and educate them what are the other choices besides that one, because we have other choices and they are for the parents need to know. So part of my platform, and I invite you to go to MarcelaGomezBogomolny.com for you to realize I, I have in one of my platforms to educate parents regarding the system so they know better and take the right choices. So at this point, taking um, enforcing the rules is important, but also remember we're talking about people. We're not talking about numbers, we're talking about human beings. Thank you. Okay, help me a little. Lucia, did you answer this question? Yes, Mayor, thank you. I started with I you. First, okay, yeah. next question to Josh, and this has been written in the chat room at least four or five times, so it's a very important question. Uh, I'll try and give it to you in, one, in just one sentence. How are you planning to address the increase in drug abuse and vaping in public schools? And we're starting with Josh. It's a great question. I, uh, I have a simple answer. You could do what I did at the Quality of Education for the City of Miami Beach, which I'm going to take countywide, and that's passing actual legislation prohibiting e-cigarettes and vapor products from being sold within 1,200 yards of the school. And you also need to have people who are monitoring uh, vaping use at the schools. And that's exactly what we did at the Quality of Education. That's exactly what I'm going to do at the school board level. Okay. Thank you. Um, Russ Rywell, same question. You know, as a teacher, I watched this vaping epidemic come and it was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. I could see the little charging jewel pods on my students' laptops. I could see the numerous trips to the bathroom. I could see the stores pop up all over the place. I did the best that I could in trying to talk to the parents and talk to the students. We debated it in my class. I had them research the issue and both sides to come to the right conclusion. But, you know, the district's response initially was zero tolerance, but this is an addictive substance, uh, nicotine. So rather than say, oh, you're going to be suspended or punished at you when we have an addicted substance, we need to have proper treatment programs. We need to have amnesty for students to come forward so that we can solve this problem, which unfortunately we created. Okay, um, next, Raquel. 
Okay, this is a mental health question, and obviously, you know, drug abuse, vaping are a national issue, a national problem. I believe that part of the problem, as I see the other lessons that I see, is that they think this is safe. They don't think there's a problem with it. I think education is going to be the answer. It needs to be within the school system that we educate as to what exactly does it do to your brain? What exactly does it do to you? And to create support groups, to create chat rooms within the schools, not refer necessarily as an addiction outside, but first try to do it within a private public type of cooperation with perhaps role models, teachers, uh, people from the universities that can lead groups that can lead to what are the consequences of things. Thank you. Thank you. Marcella. Thank you for the question. As a matter of fact, I'm the only candidate who has addressed this issue from day one. I'm the only candidate who brought the importance of mindfulness and mental health since, mental health since day one. Since for the, for the, during this campaign, now other candidates are addressing it, but I have a plan for this. Social workers partnership with the National Association of Social Workers and other universities can bring and donate their time so they can do some prevention uh, uh, activities in the community. Also, we have a coalition, parents, teachers, and clinicians to work together in something that everybody is affected by education and prevention. I, as a matter of fact, I led, I led myself as a teenager, as a 16 year old, a program in Medellin, Colombia and the whole region to prevent the use of drugs. And it was successful in every single school of the region. So I know and have experience. As a matter of fact, I am a clinician on addictions myself and I have used mindfulness as a tool to prevent these issues in our schools and our community. Thank you very much for the question. It's very, success it's very important for me. Thanks. Thank you. Lucia. So when it comes to substance abuse and addiction, I think the first step is to see it much less as a private problem, an individual problem, but as a social problem that needs to be addressed. And our school district has acknowledged the issue. They've created task force, a committee, especially with the anti-tobacco program. Um, and that's great. But we also need to be intentional about teaching students or working with them on coping mechanisms, which are often what leads to this addiction abuse, uh, mindfulness, peer mediation, restorative justice. Uh, these are things that we can do. We also really need to update our crisis response protocols. We need to have established protocols for assistance whenever we see a student that may be in crisis and moving forward as your school board member, I will be making sure we're all on the same page when it comes to the safety of our students. Thank you. Josh, did I start with you? Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, this question is going to be for, or start with uh, Russ Rywell. Name three current Miami-Dade County public school programs that would get your utmost support. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with a couple of things. One, we need to stress electives. The governor actually wanted, I hope he still does, to give money to speech and debate and uh, electives. When I talked to members of the Miami Beach alumni when I was president for three years, they don't say, oh, I liked this in English or in math. They say that Ralph Carey changed my life in speech and debate. Jay Jensen changed my life in the drama program. Um, Doug Burris and Rock Ensemble made me what I am. These are the programs that we need. And these are the first programs that they cut in a financial crisis. So I will be there. I will be fighting for that. I will be fighting for gifted programs. I will be fighting for programs that create equity, like in Crop, where they had the Be Our Guest for Lunch and Ali Ratner's Food Bank. So that's it. Electives, gifted, and equity. Thank you. Thank you. Raquel, same questions. What three programs? Okay, so the number one question is, I've been very, very supportive of special needs children. I think that their programs 
need to meet federal requirements and above. I'm very much supported by that group. Number two, everything that has to do with mental health and the application of that, which goes not only in terms of the drug abuse, but more in terms of how to institute mental health initiatives in our school board so that we can have the kids come back to our schools in a way that is going to be ready for kids to best learn. And obviously, uh, number three, uh, educational choices. I'm a lot more for the academia, the academies that are teaching, all of what is for the 21st century. How do we, besides teachers and besides attorneys, need also the plumbers, the electricians, other types of trades. Thank you. Thank you. Marcella. Yes, I saw from some, thank you for the question, it's very important. I saw from the chat that somebody mentioned that prevention programs already are in place. That will be then one of my programs to improve. As a matter of fact, if they are in place, then we're doing a very awful job on that sense because we're having very high issues in the matter of preventing use of drugs. Uh, the other one will be arts and sports as an intervention tool for them to improve our, our children, your children, self-esteem and drama. Art, sports, and drama needs to be part of the curriculum, not because it is on, only important as, uh, as a curriculum, but also as a support for their well-being. And last but not least, I would like to bring domestic or improve domestic economics classes. Our kids are, when I speak to the high schoolers, they tell me when I graduate, I have no clue how to manage my money. I believe that's one of, one of the programs that I would like to support. Thank you. Okay, I thought that was fine. Um, Lucia. Thank you. So there's so many wonderful programs in our district. Um, of course, um, there's always room to improve in all, uh, but I would be focusing on advanced academics. Uh, I believe a world-class education is what we're here to do. So I would like to increase student access to advanced academics, such as dual enrollment, advanced placement, international baccalaureate. Uh, we want to make sure that we are increasing our student success outcomes post-secondary. Once they leave us, that we're preparing them for the future and advanced academics as that. I also want to focus on our foundational skills curriculum, such as workforce training and vocational teaching. We learn by doing. I think a lot of our students will benefit by strengthening that and having internships throughout the community. I would like to work on those partnerships. And finally, of course, mental health. Uh, that's going to be us being uh, sure that we're ensuring the safety of our students and that we are funding our mental health programs uh, properly. Okay, um, Josh. Okay, uh, the first thing that I'm going to concentrate is not one particular program, but overall. I see what's happening with our children, how they're being taught for this one exam. I want them to teach, be able to think critically and have knowledge and not just to pass a test, but to understand what was significant. Uh, I recently asked my daughter uh, where she learned more of Hamilton. Was it from the theater or was it from history class? And she said the theater. Uh, we need to change it so the kids can understand, for example, why there's people marching in the streets. Get an idea of not just that they're marching in the streets, but why, what was the history behind it? And George Floyd was not murdered uh, in a vacuum. Uh, the second thing is the arts. There's a great program in Houston, which is public and private um, enterprise where every student gets 10 different arts experiences. And what happened after they went through these arts experiences is that their test scores actually improved 13%. And the last thing that I'm going to concentrate on doing is something that I witnessed firsthand at CROP. Uh, CROP invited me and I went to their PTSA meeting when a guy by the name of Steve Freed spoke. Uh, Steve Freed. Sorry, time. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to hand this back to Michael. Watching, watching the time, um, there might be a few questions you want to ask the panelists as well. Ina, thank you very much. Boy, what a, a substantive group of candidates. I'm very impressed. Uh, we want to have closing statements now from each of them. One minute closing statements, and let's reverse the order uh, with which we began. So in this case, then, I would ask Russ Rywell. Uh, Russ, please take a minute sum up your candidacy and uh, a closing statement, please. Uh, 
Thank you for this large forum and for everyone that attended. I think the difference, all the candidates are very skilled, but I think the differences here are clear. We are in a crisis situation, and I believe that I am uniquely qualified to lead us through this crisis. My opponents have many great specialties and ideas, and I would be happy to work with them on them. But this is a board that sets educational policy and manages a $5 billion budget. And you have to think who is going to be most effective in that role. And the people that have done the homework, that have given us extensive questionnaires, that have interviewed us for a half hour, 45 minutes, all of us have chosen me. The United Teachers of Dade, the ASME workers, the SROs, Mayor Gelber, Mayor Weissman, Mayor Bruder, Vice Mayor Savichin, um, those people, talk to them and they will tell you why I am the best person. Thank you. All right, Russ, thank you very much. Let's go to Joshua Levy. Uh, Mr. Levy, you have a minute to sum up uh, why you are running, why you're the best candidate. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And I hope my passion for public education came through because quite frankly, I'm the only candidate who has children in our public schools right now. I'm the only candidate who can hit the ground running, who's advocated, legislated, and is fighting for our public schools. Let's be honest, right now, five and nine members of the school board are teachers, and that's great. And teachers are well represented. But what we don't have and what is not represented are parents who have children in our schools, who chose to put their children in our school and then work tirelessly to improve not just that one school, but all the schools. People support me because of what I've already accomplished and what they know I will accomplish. My name is Joshua Levy. I'm running for school board. And if you have any other questions, my cell phone number is 305-799-0991, punch 373. Thank you. Josh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, now let's uh, have a closing statement, please, from Marcelo Gomez Bogomolny. Marcelo. Thank you very much. It has been an honor and a pleasure. I am not only an advocate, a clinician, I have also been interviewed nationally and internationally and as a matter of fact, because of my campaign and my motives and everything that I brought in, I have been called by Finland uh, newspaper to be interviewed as a model of an excellent campaign based on mindfulness and this kind of um, programs in our community. Miami-Dade County Public Schools is an excellent district. However, uh, we, we need to improve and go further to the new era, the era of mindfulness and mental health and stability. Academics is important and the board requires the social, social services values. Why? Social school values. Why? Because I am a social worker, but I'm also a clinician. I am the, the together, the, all the skills. I represent the Hispanic and the Jewish com community in this district. And I also am an expert in immigrants. Immigrants are a high level population in our district. I've been working with immigrants on the national level. Supporting them to immigrants in America. Thank you. All right, Marcella, thank you very much. And now let's hear from Dr. Raquel Bild Libin. Uh, Dr. Bild Libin. Uh, please give us your closing statement. Thank you. So we have all received very important endorsements. I've been endorsed by Barbara Kramer, Councilwoman for North Miami Beach, Carol Keys for the longtime Councilwoman of Keystone, the North Miami area, Dana Goldman from Sony Isles, Michael Congora from Miami Beach, Juliana Stroud for North Bay Village, and I won't take my time. As you know, many of the organizations that have been mentioned have never interviewed most of us, the candidates, except for one. Uh, I believe that we have educators, financial advisors, and in the administration, what we really need is a voice that is right now not represented, which is the mental health policies that are gonna be instituted when our children go back to school. I represent that voice that is the missing voice now more than ever. We need someone that is going to look at the scientific evidence to apply to our schools. You can learn more about me at drraquelforschools.com or you can call me. Thank you. Raquel, thank you very much. And finally, we want to hear from a closing statement from Lucia Baez-Geller. Lucia. Thank you. I want to once again, thank you all. Thank all the sponsors 
Um, thank you, Mr. Putney, Mayor Weissman, for this opportunity and all of the people present today. This has been a wonderful time. Um, as your next school board member, I will be representing you and I will be a voice for you and for all as I have been in the past 15 years for all of my students, teachers and their family. I know what works, what doesn't work. I know the impact of good policy and bad policy and I'm gonna be the one fighting for you. Um, I will be asking the tough questions and I will be ensuring that we have an proficient and adequate education curriculum, that we have enough school safety, mental health resources, and then we have a budget that reflects our values. I'm honored to be on this journey with the endorsement of people I've been fighting along with, um, including the local Teamsters Union, Congresswoman Donna Shalala, State Senator Annette Tadeo, State Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez, uh, State Senator Oscar Brainin, um, and I can't do this alone. I need people such as you who believe in our public schools to come with me on this journey. Please visit luciabiasgeller.com for more information. Spread the word, message me to know more, and please tell everybody that you will be electing a public school teacher who has been fighting for public education. All right, Lucia, thank you, and I want to thank all the candidates. This is really an outstanding group of candidates for a critically uh, important seat. It will not be an easy choice for a lot of voters. I want to thank uh, Gary Pyatt and the uh, inimitable Elaine Adler from the Aventura Marketing Council and my good friend and great mayor, Enid Wiseman. Thank you, Enid, as always, for helping put this together and for your leadership. And I think I throw it back to you or maybe Gary. Yep, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And first of all, thank you, Gary, Michael, for taking your- Gary, yes. can I take one thing? Absolutely, that Mayor. At least three people have written it in the chat room. It's not about this race, but it's very important. Please fill out your census. Please, <laughs> please, please fill out your census. We need it. It translates into dollars for schools, for programs. And what I heard from all of you is that's what we need is money for programs and for building enhancements. So please tell your friends to fill out the census. Gary, it's yours. Thank you very much for the reminder, Enid. We remind everybody, every one of our Zoom programs right now, please fill out your census. So again, thank you. As I was saying, thank you to Michael Putney for moderating today's program. Thank you to our partners, the City of Aventura, the Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce, our sponsors, Atlantic Broadband and Code Ninjas. To the five candidates, we wish you all of the best. Today's program, even after we got through all the introductions, was just a little over an hour, so we appreciate all excess of 80 uh, members that participated and logged on to the program today for staying through till almost 1130. And a big thank you, as I said earlier, a big thank you to Dr. Martin Karp for representing District 3 so, so well for the, for the last, uh, the, the, over the last 16 years. Remember, vote, stay safe, wear your masks. Wear your masks and stay safe. Thank you to everybody and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll Thank all you. get the video recording of this. You'll all get it. <laughs> the whole video recording. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Adler. Thank this you. was fun. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello. Hello. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Billy Joel. Hello. Hello. How Thank are you? you? Hello, Bob. Excellent. Bye. 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 Great Bye. job. Bye. Great job. Bye. 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 Bye.